All right, well, good morning again to all of you, and, and happy Valentine's Day um, again to, uh, to each and every one of you. As uh, Carlos mentioned a little while ago, uh, we are talking today about um, our love for, for God. We're doing a, a three-part sermon series centered around Valentine's Day, centered around this very day, talking about love. First was God's love for us. Today is, is our love for God, and then next week will be our love for ourselves and for others all over the place. But today is Valentine's Day. Now, if you research Valentine's Day, it's kind of interesting because there's a lot of mystery about Valentine's Valentine's Day. Nobody really knows for certain how we got this holiday. Uh, Some legends say that there was a a man, a Christian martyr, in fact, way, way back, that would perform marriages for people that were in love but but shouldn't get married according to the government or whatever, and then he was killed because of his faith, and I don't know. The best I can figure is that the card companies, the, the florists, and the candy manufacturers all got together and made up something so that we would give all of those gifts to our, our loved ones. I'm not sure, but the legend is that we, we just really don't know exactly how we got Valentine's Day. But what we do know is that now we have it, February 14th, each and every year. And Valentine's Day is all about love. That's what this day is all about, expressing our love for our loved ones. And so today we're going to be talking about love in general. And, and as I mentioned last week, there's such, such mystery about love itself. We, we just can't really comprehend love. And I believe that there's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of misuse of the word love out there all across the world, and probably especially here in America, because we don't have many words to describe the love that we are feeling so I think it's just one of the, ma- the major misunderstood words out there. And attributing to that factor is a misunderstanding of, of God's love for us and a misunderstanding of, of our love back for, for God. And I think when those are, are blurred and not as clear, we just don't understand the concept and idea of love in general. Now, I know in Teresa and I's case, when, when we got married, she was a born-again believer, and I was lost. I didn't know who Jesus was. I didn't know that I needed him as my Lord and, and Savior. And so when we got lost, we had completely different values in life and, and especially towards God. Um, so then fast forward a, a couple of years, and, and I came to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And boy, I was radically changed. The Bible says I was born again and made a brand new creation, and I lived it. I experienced that. I truly was. But I still was very young and immature in my faith. And I was young and immature just just as a man. And you can ask Teresa, um, boy, as I grew in my faith, I matured a lot as a man also. And the cool and wonderful thing about Jesus is the more we put our faith and trust in him, the more we grow in our maturity and our understanding of who he is and what he's done for us, the more we mature in our life also. And one of the greatest things that we experienced in Teresa and I's marriage was that the more mature I got as a follower of Jesus, the stronger my love was for my wife and for my family. Stronger and stronger and stronger. And it, it's just absolutely amazing. The more I love God, the more that he, I realize how much he loved me, the more I love my family and my friends and, and, and everybody. So it's just kind of a, a, you understand one, you begin to understand the other one, and they all work together to create a great love that spreads, spreads all over. But today we're talking about our love for God. And boy, the Bible is thick with verses talking about our need to love God. We are told over and over and over. But today I'm going to go to one of the earlier passages. We're going to go to the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and begin in verse 4. Just, just three short verses, but, but I want to go through and explain a little bit more about what this means because this idea that we're told to love God with everything that we have is throughout Scripture. You can almost turn to any book and almost any chapter and you'll find those very words. But today, as we discuss loving God with everything we have, we're in Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 4. The passage says, listen, Israel, and you can insert God's people in there because now we're living in the New Testament era when there are much more believers in Jesus (coughs) than just the, the Hebrew people or the Jewish people. So listen, God's people, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. 
these words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Let's pray. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we bow our heads before you this morning recognizing that you are the one true living God and that you have proven your love for us. And Father, I pray that you will speak into our lives today and help us better understand how it is that we can show our love for you. Father, I thank you for the the word, for this message, and I pray that you will take it and preach it through me here this morning boldly and clearly that we may better understand who you are and how we can love you all over this world. Father, thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we know that the Bible is is thick with teaching us that we're to love God with everything that we have, right? Everyone knows that. That's what God wants. That's what God expects. And quite frankly, that's what God deserves from from you and I, from born-again believers, is that we love him with all that we have. It's kind of like that Sunday school answer when you want to know an an issue in life, when you want to hear God's voice, what do you do? You read your Bible and pray, right? It's it's an easy thing to say. That answer makes sense when you you think about that way. But how do we actually live that out? That's that's the difficult part. And so today I want to take this verse, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. And I want to break it down and see what this actually look like. What does it look like for us, for you and I today, to love God with all of our heart and then all of our soul and all of our strength? So we're just going to break it down that way. The first thing that we're told is that we're to, to love God with all of our heart. And we know, we've talked about hearts quite a bit here. Our, our hearts are very, very serious. If you have a, a um, heart condition, the, the medical um, people take that very, very seriously. If you go into the emergency room with a heart issue, you're getting right back and getting hooked up to machines. They want to know what's going on with your heart. Our heart is core to our existence. Our our heart is is vital to life itself, and and God knows that. God knows that that where our heart is, everything else then follows. Our heart is is what, where we place our heart is what we're placing our value and even our very life on. And so our heart is crucial and key, and that's why we're told throughout Scripture so many times, so often, to love God with all of our heart. We know that our heart is essential for salvation. Our heart is, the, is what we can commit murder with and sexual sin. It all happens in our hearts before it ever happens in our actions. And it's the same thing with loving God. And that's why I believe that God puts this first. It's first and foremost because without loving God with our heart, nothing else follows along. So that's why we're told throughout and throughout and throughout so many times to love God with all of our heart. Without this one, none of the rest ever, ever happens. Now, I gave an illustration uh, several weeks ago during my series on uh, building your kingdom here, asking God to build his kingdom here. I gave you an illustration of how I began uh, to date Teresa. When I first began to date her and began to get to know her, wow, I was more and more taken by her each and every time we were together. And the more we were together, the more time I spent, the more I got to know her in a deeper level, the more I fell in love with her. And it just kept snowballing from there, and it wasn't very long. And I realized, wow, I believe that this is the woman that I want to spend the rest of my life with. And our relationship, my love for her just grew and grew. We could spend all day together, and I would never get tired of being with her. We didn't always have to be talking either. We could sometimes just be near each other, and that was enough because I was by the one that I loved. I proposed to her, praise God, I don't know why, but she said yes, and we got married 18 and a half years ago, and I still love my wife. In fact, I love her more and more today than I ever have before. And it's so interesting and so cool as I know and love God more and more. I love my wife that much more. I love my family. It's just such a snowball effect. But like my relationship with my wife, like it was when we were dating and getting to know each other, the more I got to know her, the more I loved her. And the more I loved her, the more I got to know her and the more I loved her. And it just kept growing and building from there. It's exactly the same way with our God. If you don't know who he is, if he's some vague, distant God sitting off somewhere in heaven that we can't see or touch or whatever, it's kind of hard to love that kind of a God, especially with all of our heart. And so the way we do it, the way that you and I can love God with all of our heart is we get to know him. 
We get to know him and we spend time with him. Sometimes talking, but a lot of time just listening. Getting to know him through worshiping him and praising him and reading his word and, and praying to him, just spending time together. That's the way that it works. That's the way we get to know, to know him. Notice it's, it's interesting that um, the first commandment, We've been going through that in, in the book of Exodus in some of the Sunday school classes, the ones that are going through the gospel project. But we've been looking at the different Ten Commandments, and the first one, the one that's above all others, is that you shall have no other gods besides me. Now, some translations say before me. Some will, will say that, but a, that's not an accurate translation. A much better, much more accurate translation, back to the original Hebrew, what God spoke down into Moses, much more accurate is God said to us, to you and I, that we shall have no other gods besides him. Now think about that. If you grew up understanding that it was no other gods before me, then that means there can be some other gods, smaller gods after him, that our God is one of many gods. God doesn't settle for second place, third, fourth. He doesn't settle for anyone else even being on the same platform as him. So I want you to think about the, this better translation that you shall have no other gods besides me. None. Not one. Now where our heart is, is, is our God. What our heart is, is loving, what our heart is focusing upon is our God. It's what we're worshiping. And quite frankly, we have lots and lots of small g gods in our lives. And God says that that's wrong. That's breaking the very first commandment. But we're to love God with all of our heart, with, with everything that we have. All of our heart. Now, when we, we love God with everything we have, when, when we put Him in first place, and I don't want to make that sound like first place is enough because there shouldn't even be a second place or a third place. We need to put Him so much higher than anything else in our life. There is no second place, okay? Okay. Hear me say that. When we make him first and top in our lives, it changes everything. It, it changes all of our priorities in our life. What was important to us in the past is no longer as important as it is today. Because God, when we experience and know him, when we love him more, it changes everything. It changes our very priorities. And suddenly, his worship is worth more than all of these other things that used to compete for our time. Loving God with all our heart changes our, our, our priorities. It changes our perspective on, on life. It changes how we view things. Think about the, this world view out there when it's all about self and me, myself and I, and I need this and I want that and I deserve this. Look out everybody else because it's all about me. It changes our very perspective on looking out at the world. When we put God first, we see how majestic and holy He is and how insignificant we are. And suddenly we realize that we're not quite as important as we thought we were. He's the thing that's important. He's the one that's the most important. It changes our perspective. It, it changes our, our purpose even in life, what we're here for. When we put God in his rightful place on his throne and we love him with all of our heart more and more all the time, it changes our very purpose for even being here. When we recognize God and his sovereignty, his holiness, and his call to all children of his, all born-again believers of his, to be out in the world, not of the world, but in the world on mission for him and his kingdom and his glory. Loving God with all our heart changes everything. It changes our priorities, our, our perspective, and our purpose, but it also changes our, our passion. What about this? If you want to love God more... If you want to, to experience him in an even greater way, put your passion into him. Put what you're striving for, working for, and thinking about into him. Be passionate about him and his word and loving on him and watch out. Watch what happens. When you know God and experience him and begin to love him more, it just changes everything. Dedicate and devote the best time of each day to him. Dedicate and devote the best time of each day over to Him. I know it's harder and harder these days as we get busier and busier with our lives to do that. But God, again, remember, He doesn't settle for second place. There shouldn't even be a second place. And so how about giving Him the best time of the day? Maybe for some of you that's extra early in the morning. 
You can wake up and it's still dark outside and there's very little distractions. And you can sit down with a copy of God's Word with the Holy Bible and you can come into His presence right there and spend quality time, the best time of the day with Him. Maybe that's right before bed. Maybe it's in the middle of the day over your lunch hour. Maybe you can go sit in the truck or whatever it is. You have to iron out that out. You have to grind that out and work that out in your own life. But how about giving Him the best time of each day? There's a, a saying out there, E7, experience God seven days a week or encounter God seven days a week. If you want to love God with all your heart, it can't be one day a week or two days a week. It's got to be every area of your life, every part of your life, every bit of your life, encountering Him seven days a week and then talking about Him all over talking about Him and telling other people about Him, who He is, what He's done for them, and even more importantly, what He is currently doing in your life today. Loving God with all our heart, is that easy? No. Is it possible? <laughs> Absolutely. Give it a shot. Wherever you're at today, the awesome thing about God is it doesn't matter where you were yesterday. It doesn't matter where you are today because you can always give him more. And as you give him more, he then fills you that much more. And you can encounter him in an even deeper and richer way. And then you will love him even more than you ever thought possible. Love God with all your heart. Boy, it's just an ongoing process. But then he gets into to love the Lord your God with all your soul. Now I've got some late-breaking, very powerful news for you here today. I mean, this is going to be really shocking and surprising and great information for all of you here. I am so sure of that. Are you ready? There's a difference between animals and humans. It's true. There is a difference between animals and humans. We are, we are radically different, in fact. Much more than four feet versus two, uh, much more than a coat of hair and tails and, and all those things, much more than all of that. Humans and animals are, are radically different. Now, one is the main thing, the difference between humans and animals is that we have a soul. Animals do not, humans do. We have a soul and our soul is eternal. Animals have hearts, they have breath in their lungs, they, they live and breathe and, and then they die. The humans have a soul, and our soul is eternal. Our soul is the most valuable part of our, our inner being. God made us different. God made man unique. God made man separate from all of the animals. God took the dust of the earth, and he formed it into a man, and then he breathed the very breath of life into the man. The animals, he just created them, and they were there. He can do that, but man is so unique and so special. We are the crowning jewels of his creation. And get this, God made you and I in his image. God made us like him. Now, do not misunderstand and mishear me. And we can, if you want to talk about this, I'd love to sit down over coffee and discuss this much deeper. But there is a, a great misunderstanding that God then looks like us or whatever. And that is not true. That is not correct. God made humans in his image with the likeness of him being able to think and, and rationalize, being able to have empathy for, for people, and being able to be sinless and perfect. Remember, Adam and Eve were created in God's image, sinless and perfect. However, they also had free will. And when tempted by the enemy, they, they succumbed to that temptation and fell and sinned, whatever, and broke the relationship. But still, God created man in his image, like him. Likeness is like him in our nature, not in our physical presence. Jesus changed form when he came down to be like a man fully man and fully God all at the same time. But anyway, the difference is that we have a soul and our soul is eternal. Our soul is, the, is a valuable part of our inner man, our, our inner being. But God, he wants us to, to love him like he loves us. And he loves us with his very soul. He loves us with his greater, more valuable inner being, and he wants us to love him with our greater, more valuable inner being, with our eternal souls. God wants us to pant and pursue him with everything that we have. 
That's kind of what it begins to look like loving God with, with, our, with our souls. A passionate and excited love for Him. A joyful love for Him. Even, how about this, a fiery love for Him. God wants us to pursue Him and know Him with every ounce of our inner beings. Not just our heart that can bounce and change and, and ver, veer and steer all over the place, but with our soul that is constant and forever and ever. Now, can I get, can I get real for a little bit? Can I just be, be brutally honest for a minute? And you have to keep this to ourselves, okay? Because we have to be careful how we go about this because we don't want to, to hurt someone's feelings and, and break their heart and then stop their growth in relationship with, with the Lord. But I'm going to be very real for a minute. So I've witnessed some heartbreaking things in my, in my years as a pastor, in my years as a follower, and I couldn't understand it when I was young, and I still don't understand it today. But one of the most heartbreaking things I see is I've seen people, men and women, young and, and old, very, very passionately, very, very excited about their favorite sports team. I've seen men and women go absolutely crazy, absolutely nuts over a touchdown, over an interception, over a basket, a goal, a good shot, or a dropped ball. I've seen men and women go absolutely nuts over things on a sports field and stand there in, in church and very embarrassed to even think about possibly raising their voice a little bit. Breaks my heart to watch people get more excited about a sports team than the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. It breaks my heart to watch people passionately pursue other things and get more excited about other people than they do the one true God of heaven and earth. That's not loving God with all of our soul. It breaks my heart to hear people talking back and forth, believers talking back and forth about statistics that make my head spin. They know everything about every player on the current team, last year's team, the team from 10 years ago, even the teams from 50 years ago. They know numbers, where they're from, what colleges they played, left-handed, right-handed, what their batting statistics were, whatever. They know everything about everyone in the game and don't know any of the books of the Bible don't tell me that we can't memorize Scripture. Don't tell me that we can't know and love God more because I see it all the time. It breaks my heart when people get more excited about a touchdown than they do Jesus Christ. He is the one that loved us and gave himself for us. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Our inner beings our deep-seated passions. We should love Him more. We should show our love for Him more than the Bears or the Cardinals or the Cubs or whoever. We should show our love for Him passionately. Passionately growing and excited and joyful and fiery, loving Him. Wow, the bottom line, to love God with all of our soul means that we love Him with a strong desire with true emotions and with powerful enthusiasm. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul. And then finally, the third thing, God says, love the Lord your God with all of your strength. Years ago, there was a, a circus that came to town. Now, this was an old-style circus, and in this circus act was the old, traditional, strong man act. And this circus had an incredible strong man. He was the, probably the strongest guy out there. And this strong man put on quite a show. Boy, he could pick up huge weights and do all kinds of things with weights. And he was bursting with all kinds of muscles. This guy was the strongest out there. He just wowed the crowds with all of his feats of strength. And as one final closing act in his, in his strong man act, what this man did was he picked up a lemon. And he took the lemon and he placed a glass underneath it. And he took the lemon and put it between his hands. And with all of his strength and all of his might, he crushed and squeezed that lemon and juice just poured out of it. And he squeezed the lemon with everything he had until nothing would come out any longer. And then the strong man set the, the lemon down on the table and he bet the audience, he says, I will give anyone that can get one more drop of juice out of this lemon, I'll give you $100. And boy, a couple of big strong guys from the crowd got up and, and they ran down there and they picked up that lemon and squeezed with everything that they had and couldn't get one drop to come. 
Guy after guy after guy tried and everyone failed. And then the man, the strong man said, anyone else like to give this a try? And in the back, this little elderly man wearing glasses and suspenders, he got up from the back and he slowly made his way down and everyone thought, now who is this little bitty tiny elderly man? What's he possibly going to do? How could he get anything to come out of that lemon that these other more powerful men did? And so this little man came up on the stage and he picked up the lemon and he kind of looked it over and he put it between his small thin hands and he began to squeeze that lemon and wouldn't you know it, but a single drop of lemon juice came out of that lemon. And the strong man's eyes just bugged out of his head. He couldn't believe what this little tiny man had done. And the strong man picked up the $100 and he handed it to the guy and he said, Sir, I have to know, how is it that you were able to do that? Where do you get your strength from? How could you squeeze that final drop out of the lemon? And the little man looked up at the giant strong man and he said, Well, sir, he says, I've been the treasurer of my little tiny country church for 45 years. And I've learned to squeeze the last penny out of every single dollar. God says we're to love him with all of our strength, with everything that we have. And quite frankly, this one, this third one, is where the rubber meets the road. This is where our actions speak much louder than our words. If we love God with our heart and we love God with our soul, then our strength will automatically follow. This is kind of the proof that is in the pudding. As I said, this is where the rubber truly meets the road. Here's where where it all really truly happens. This is where our love for Jesus motivates our lives. This is where we use our strength and our gifts for His service. If we're to love the Lord our God with all of our strength, this is where our life shows it and proves it with the things that we do. Now, those of you that were able to make the uh, Metro Peoria board meeting on Monday night, uh, Carmen Halsey did a phenomenal job of speaking and, and speaking some truth into all of us, women and men. But one of the things that she said and reminded me of what Dr. Joe Gardner has said before, and he's got a great illustration for contrasting chores and work. And Carmen, that, she heard him say that down at McCoupin Baptist Association's annual meeting a couple years ago. And what Dr. Joe said really made an, an impact in Carmen's life. And now as she travels around, she shares with other people because I think that we've all fallen into a trap of confusing chores and work. And I'm not going to steal Dr. Joe's illustration, but, but the bottom line is that, that out on the farm, you have to get up early, bright and early, before the sun comes up, and go out and you've got to gather the eggs and feed the pigs and feed the cows and do all of those things that you have to do. And then you come in and eat breakfast. And all that work that went on to maintain the farm, all that was was chores. That was just keeping the farm going, keeping everything going along smoothly. And then after breakfast, that's when the work starts. That's when you go out and actually do the things that you have to do to be able to provide for your family, to be able to grow the the, the kingdom, grow the empire that you're creating. That's the difference between chores and work, maintaining versus doing what, what, what is extra and on top of all of that. And I think that we in the church have really gotten confused in our service for the Lord and in getting confused between chores and work. Now, we need people to do things here. We have to have people that are willing to come in and serve and and paint and clean and, and, and update things and keep up with the times. We have to do that. But don't fall into the trap of thinking that that in itself is service for the Lord, is using your strength for Him. Those are chores. Those we we have to do to maintain our building. That's not the work that he has created us to do. The work that he has called us and created us and charged us to do is serving him and his kingdom all over the globe. And he put it quite simply, we're to make disciples. To make disciples that make disciples. And that's a huge process, I, I understand. But it begins with us being faithful and telling people about our passionate love affair with Jesus Christ because of who he is and what he's done for us. We can't fall into the trap of confusing chores and work. God created us for much more than this. He created us for such a time as this to make an impact in this lost, dark world for him and for his glory. 
Jesus puts it quite clearly and quite frankly. He says, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. And a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. And then he says, you will know them, you will know his followers by their fruit, by their service, by their work, by us using our strength for him and for his glory. He says, you will know them by their fruits. There will be no question who it is that loves him with everything that we have. And then James tells us a very familiar verse. He says, faith without works is dead. And if you really break that down and get into the meat of it, that's because there is no such thing as faith without works because our faith produces works. Our faith and our love for the king makes us then use our strength for him. For him, for his kingdom, for all of eternity, and for his glory. Love the Lord your God with all your, your, your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The Lord commands us to prove our love for Him. The Lord commands us to to show our love for for Him. And by the way, that can mean way outside your comfort zone. Way outside your comfort zone. Doing something that that you never thought in a million years you could ever do for Him. God doesn't care about comfort zones. Coming from a man who had a tremendous fear of public speaking. I said, God, if you're calling me to preach, you've got to remove it. And he did. God doesn't care about comfort zones. He wants you to love him so much that you will do whatever and whenever. That's what it means to love him with all of our strength. Building our lives around him and what he's done for us and allowing those truths to then dictate every other area of our life, that we pursue him with everything that we can do. There's so much confusion out there about about love. Love is one of the most misunderstood words in the English language. I think we just can't quite comprehend it. But I believe if we want to know it, if we want to comprehend it, if we want to know what love really means, then we have to understand God's love for us first. And as we know and understand God's love for us, it helps us then to love God more and more, to love Him with all of our heart and soul and strength. Now, that misunderstanding of love It goes into all areas of our life. That means we can't quite understand what it really means to love our parents and to love our children and our grandparents and to love our neighbor as ourself. I think those lines are blurred. But again, when we understand God's love for us and then we start to love him more and more, it makes love become alive. And then that filters down and permeates into every other area of our life. That's what we're going to be talking about next week. What's it mean for us to love ourselves and then love others like ourselves. That's next week. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you again for this this great day to gather here today and to praise and worship you because you are truly worthy. And Father, I pray that you will take this truth of what it means for us, each and every one of us, to love you with all that we are. And I pray that through this, we would grow in our love affair, our love relationship with you, because you truly are worthy. So Father, continue to grow us and mature us, mold us and shape us to be more like Jesus each and every day. And Father, continue to use us for your glory. May hearts and lives be changed. Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.